morning, Camelback Bible Church. Thank you. It's good to see you all here. Go ahead and find your seat as we get started. Well, good morning. Welcome to Camelback Bible Church. My name is Bajan. I'm the pastor of students here at Camelback. Uh, we are gathered here this morning as a church to worship God who has delivered us from the kingdom of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of his beloved son. If you're a visitor with us this morning, I want to say how grateful we are to have you, and we would love the opportunity to meet you. Um, so one of the ways that we try to connect with, folk, connect with folks is we ask you to pull out your phone, text Welcome CBC to 94000. That'll get you a digital connect card where you can fill out some contact information. And then myself or one of the other pastors will be sure to reach out to you, meet you, and welcome you to our body. Another way that we try to connect with folks is through our Discovery classes. Our Discovery 1 class is going to be starting on February 6th. Uh, that's the first Sunday of February. And this class is for people who are new to the church, want to get some more information, learn more about us. Um, so if you are interested in that, you can navigate to our website and then hit Calendar, and then you'll be able to find signups there for that class. So if you are interested in that, mark your calendar for February 6th. Um, we are also starting up Teleos classes, and uh, particularly Christianity Explored. We had our first one today. There was one that met at 9 a.m., and I believe there might be one meeting right now at this hour. Is that right, Ron? Yeah, so Christianity Explored is in full swing, guys. We really want to invite you to uh, make that a priority, either personally with someone who doesn't know the Bible or as a community group, or maybe you just, yourself, you want to find out how to be faithful with the gospel in your neighborhood. This is a wonderful way to do that. It's a tool to help equip you to bring God's word into the places where God has placed you. He has put you in that neighborhood, particularly to, to share the gospel with people around you. So um, prioritize that. You can still sign up for it. Um, and, and again, go through calendar and signups, or if you have the Church Center app, you can navigate and sign up. And lastly, I want to once again make it known to the men our uh, work day, January 22nd. Uh, again, this is going to be an opportunity for us to serve, to use our gifts and abilities to serve the Lord, both here at the church and at the Hope Women's Center. So you have the option to do either or, or you can spend the whole morning doing that. But uh, make sure to make that a priority. We're going to get together. If you have more questions, Pastor Ron has more information. Otherwise, sign up. And uh, again, all these things can be found on Church Center this morning. Well, let's go ahead and stand and worship the Lord this morning. This is amazing grace. 
is for us. The Father's love is a strong and mighty fortress. Raise your voice now. No love is great. Who can stand against us if our God is for us? Sing with joy now. Our God is for us. The Father's love is a strong and mighty fortress. All right, please uh, stay standing as I share from God's Word and then lead us together in prayer. From Hebrews 12, 28 and 29, therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Let's pray together. Holy Father, you are unchangeable. You are an all-powerful king in a kingdom that cannot be shaken. We praise you as our God and our Lord. We are truly in awe of you as a creator and sustainer for the trillions of galaxies in the intricacies of uh, the trillions of atoms in our bodies. You provided food for us last night, uh, rest last night, and you've gathered us together to worship as a family in your presence. We marvel at your amazing grace, your love, your goodness, your wisdom, your truth, and your justice. And as a just and a righteous God, you don't share your glory with worthless idols, idols that we are drawn to in our own lives. Father, you burn up unholiness. Your holy word and your son and your spirit tell us how to stay close to you and how to stay away from darkness. But still, we tend to stray. Sometimes we actively rebel and we turn away from listening and to, to following your ways. And sometimes we focus our, on ourselves and we neglect you. Jesus teaches us to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. Father God, we confess that there are times when we live in darkness, when we have actively rebelled against you, when we've neglected you and we've not loved you and our neighbors as you commanded. Please listen as we confess our sins. And please forgive us according to Jesus' sacrifice, the perfect Jesus, who entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption for us. Help us to enjoy walking moment by moment in your light, knowing that God is for us. We pray these things. In the name of Jesus, our Lord, amen. The children are dismissed. Safely.
sit down and we'll pray together. And in case you're wondering, that song we sing, you know, here I raise my Ebenezer, what does that mean? What's an Ebenezer? That's a strange church word. Well, it actually comes from 1 Samuel chapter 7. It's a time when uh, God's people were in need and they were under attack and they called out to God and he saved them. And here's what it says in 1 Samuel 7 verse 12. Then Samuel took a stone and set it up between Mizpah and Shen, two places, and called its name Ebenezer. For he said, till now the Lord has helped us. And Ebenezer means stone, stone of help. So when we think that, when we sing that, we're thinking back, when has God been really visible in my life and helped? And I'm going to mark that, and I'm not going to forget it. I'm going to raise an Ebenezer. That's what that song means. Well, we have so many ways that God has helped us, and we have a lot of things that are on our hearts right now, so let's look to him in prayer. Lord, as we're coming to you in prayer, we, uh, we really want to know you and to see you and uh, to experience you. You've been our help. You have been our Ebenezer, and we want to look to you for help once again today. And so, Lord, as we're coming to you now, we think back to the past, and we just trace in our minds the different ways that you have been there and done great things, ways that you have provided, opportunities that you have opened up, protection that we only saw afterwards. Lord, you've been our help. And so today we do raise our Ebenezer and we say, Lord, we, we look to you. We don't forget what you've done, but we hope in you. And so, Lord, we want to hope in you today and we trust you that you who were with us in the past will be with us in the future. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So we put our hope in you. Lord, we entrust our children into your hands, and we pray that uh, as we think of our children and our students, that you would be their rock and that they would find you to be faithful in their days, just like we have found you to be faithful in ours. We pray that they would hope in you and follow you and trust you and know you and love you. Lord, we pray that you would be a rock and uh, our confidence today um, as we think of the requests that are on our hearts, as we think about issues that we're wrestling with at work or difficulties in our family or physical issues. We pray, Lord, for those, the many who are sick with COVID, even 
Uh, today, we see a lot of our brothers and sisters not here, uh, but home and online, and we pray that you would heal them. We pray, Lord, for those who are in physical need. We think of Hank Martin and Hank Tomlinson, Gary Baylock, Randy Vogel, little Lucas, David Duffus. Lord, we pray for your healing touch to the members of our body. We pray that we will trust in you and that they will be able to look back on this, if not in this life, in the years, in eternity to come and say, Lord, the Lord is with me. He was my, he was my help, an Ebenezer. Lord, we pray for our country and we pray that we as a people would look to you just as the people of Israel did in First Samuel 7. We pray that we as a nation would be drawn to you and repent and confess our sins and hope in you. We pray for peace in our country. We thank you for the safe release of hostages in Texas. Lord, we pray for the gospel to go out around the world. In particular, we pray for our missionaries this morning, Marie Blanchard in Spain, and Pablo and Jane Cinco in Slovakia, and ask for your grace to them. Lord, we pray all these things looking to you, our helper, we raise our Ebenezer. Amen. Both we'll stand together and greet each other. All right, well, let's pull it back together, everybody. It's good to see you. So many people that are gone because of COVID and sick, and it's great that, uh, that you're here. So um, one of the things that we talk about often are our community groups, and so we're here to talk with John. Um, I'll do the first one. Y'all set? Yes. Okay, good. Um, so, you know, we're here to talk with John and Connie Milligan about community groups. Um, and at the beginning of the year, it's a great time to get plugged in with that. So how long have you guys been involved in community groups, John and Connie? Well, we, we came to Camelback roughly 14 years ago. And, um, and then when we decided, that, yes, this was a good church fit, we, I can't remember if we looked for one or if we were invited pretty quickly into one, but we realized, you know, a bigger church, how do we get to know people here? You talk for 30 seconds or a minute or maybe five minutes that it's not enough to get to know people. So you get into a community group because that's how you get to know people. And uh, I mean, sometimes there are class that you can do it, but if you want to get to know people, you get into a group. So how has that been part of your growth in Christ as a Christian, your personal walk with Jesus? How has that helped you? Well, I think for us, it's, it's a different kind of group. It's not an affinity group. Like, in fact, early on in a different church, most oftentimes the groups are grouped by what age you are. And we felt like you really need a group that's different ages. And we, we found one there, but here we just joined one and it just happens to have grown different ages and stages. So we have some couples and some singles and some widows and some just single people. So it's been 
and older and younger. And I think with that, it's not like you're just getting, this isn't people you would normally just reach out to and want to be with and go to dinner with or whatever, but this is a chosen group like a family and you choose to care for each other and get to know each other. So um, what would you say to people who are not in a community group? Um, convince me to join one. Well, <clears throat> so you're new here. Would you like to get to know people in this church? Yes, better? I would. Well, let me, let me get you in a group that's going to help you do that. Wow, that would be and, fantastic. And you know what? So you have a favorite thing you like to do that you like to hang out with people? I really do. Well, you know what? That's a different group. Oh. This group. <laughs> This group is going to be people that are different. And you're going to look across the room and go, well, that look, person looks a little weird. And, you know, that person kind of itches their nose. And, and they're going to look at us and go, who are these weirdos coming into our group? And you know what? That's the body of Christ. And so if you want to join, if you want to grow in the body, you're going to be with parts of the body that are a little different. And that's how you, that's how you function in the unity. That's how you grow just like part of a family. And so it, it's a great way to grow in Christ, get to know people. So I need to be part of the family. Ready to sign? I am, actually. <laughs> as a matter of fact, if you do want to get connected with a community group, you can stop at the table back there and uh, get some information, or you can um, email uh, Pastor Ron Elward. Is Ron here? I don't see him. Is he somewhere? Probably with the kids. He's around somewhere. He's probably with the kids, yeah. Uh, email, find his email on the church website, um, rlward at camelbackbible.com, and um, he'll get you plugged in. So thanks very much. Sure appreciate it. And um, so we have uh, our time now when we uh, can offer ourselves and our gifts to the Lord. And um, if you brought an offering today, there's boxes in the back. You can drop it in there. A lot of us are giving online. And we've got this great promise from Scripture as we do from uh, Philippians chapter 4. My God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. That's our confidence as we give.
Well, today's reading comes from the book of Colossians, chapter 1, verses 9 through 14. And so, from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Joel. Keep your Bibles open to Colossians uh, chapter 1, and we're going to be looking at this in some more detail here. Um, on Tuesday mornings, the pastors have a staff meeting, and so we meet right across the way there in room 209, and one of the first things I do is I open up the shades because I want to be able to see Camelback and see this beautiful patio here. And uh, we meet from about 8 o'clock till about 11.30. And the first hour, um, hour and 20 minutes, uh, we spend praying for the church. And that's an important part of our work. And so we start by talking about our praises, what we've seen God do, what we're thanking him for. And then we list our petitions, the things that we're asking him for. And so this past week, we praised God for his work in a young woman's life. We praised him for a new home for one of our staff members. We thanked him for a great worship service. Uh, one, of, one of us had a great conversation with uh, a leader here in the church, and we thanked God for that. We thanked him for healing for some of the people in our body and there were just a number of ways that we saw God at work, and so we began with praises, and then our petitions. We prayed for our sick by name. We had about 10 people that we know of that have COVID that we prayed for, and another nine with different physical issues. And by the way, if something's going on, please let us know so we can be praying for you, particularly if you're in the hospital or have, have a physical need. We prayed for God to lead in the selection of new elders that we're going to be voting on on our congregational meeting in May. We prayed for our leaders as they start working on next year's budget. The fiscal year starts July 1, but we're starting to put that together now. We prayed for our students, especially with winter camp coming up this weekend. We prayed for a marriage that's in trouble in our church. We prayed for our church planting partnership. We prayed for salvation for 
children, for family, for neighbors, for uh, our Christianity Explored class that is sharing the gospel with people. We prayed for our community groups. We prayed for love and grace and forgiveness and unity in our body, things that God does in our hearts. We prayed for strength to fight sin and temptation. And a number of other things that uh, we knew of that uh, we were praying for our church family because we love you and that's a great part of our ministry is praying for you. And we're not the only ones that pray for Camelback, of course, because whenever the elders get together, the elders pray too. And then you are praying for your church family as well. And so there's a lot of prayer that goes up for the body. We love our church. And we know that this is God's church. This is his work. And so we look to him. Jesus said, I will build my church. And so we look to Jesus as he is building us. Because all of our service and energy, all of our gathering and our giving is pointless if God isn't at work as we work. Remember the psalm says, if, unless uh, the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. We don't want to be building, 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 working, 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 and God not actually working through us. So as a church, how should we be praying for ourselves? How should you and I be praying for Camelback? And Paul's prayer for the church in Colossae is a classic model for us to follow. And we have this report of what he's praying for in verses 9 through 14. And this is a timeless prayer. The ruins of Colossae today, you can see them still in the Lycus Valley in eastern Turkey. But God's work among his people doesn't change. And so this prayer is a model for us in Paradise Valley today too. And he's, there's two parts that we're going to look at. First, his request in verse 9, he prays for knowledge. And then the result of that request, lives that are worthy of Jesus. And that's in verses 10 through 14. So we have the request and the result. And that's going to be the shape of, of this sermon as we walk through this passage. How should we pray? How should we pray for Camelback for a church family? And we start with Paul's request in verse 9. And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Now, that is Paul's only request in this entire paragraph. It's one long sentence in Greek. And the whole thing expands on this one prayer for knowledge. Isn't that unusual? We pray for a lot of things. We pray for health. We pray for a new job, for reconciliation. We pray for someone's salvation. We pray for good grades. But we don't often pray for knowledge. Frankly, praying for knowledge might seem intellectual and cerebral to you. A seminary professor might pray for knowledge. But this seems like a dry prayer to an average Christian. Pray for knowledge? But in fact, nothing could be farther from the truth. This is full of life and sap and juice and vitality that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will. The knowledge of God's will is the knowledge of what God has done in Christ. God's will for you, for me, for the world, for the universe is to make Jesus supreme, for him to conquer and restore and to govern all creation as unquestioned ruler and king. That is God's will. We've rebelled against God but God raised up Jesus to end our insurrection and rule us for our good, to bless us, to do good to us. We can see this supremacy of Jesus if you just glance down the page a little bit at verse 18, 
where he says that Jesus is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. Why, verse 18? That in everything he might be preeminent. That is God's great plan and purpose for this world, to make Jesus preeminent. Or as the Apostle Paul says elsewhere in Ephesians chapter 1, God has made known to us the mystery of his will, which he set forth in Christ, to unite all things in him, things in heaven and on earth. That's God's will. That's the first thing you need to know about God's will. Because God's will for your life and mine fits into that bigger picture. His plan for you is a component of his greater plan to raise up Jesus Christ as king and ruler over all things, to bring his blessing and his goodness and his justice and his care. So the knowledge of God's will is knowing what God has done in Christ. Jesus took his throne by dying for sinners and rising again. The cross led to the crown. This is the gospel. That's what the knowledge of his will actually is. But we need to understand what kind of knowledge Paul is talking about too. Because it's not just intellectual content. It's the kind of knowledge that shapes and changes and motivates you. If you're in a class, you hold the subject matter you're studying out here and you kind of turn it around and you master it. Whether it's calculus or whether it's the works of Robert Frost or whether it's a period in history You master that content. And it's true, there is content to knowing the knowledge of God's will. Who he is, what Christ has done, what his will is for this world. There is intellectual content. Ignorance isn't a virtue. We're not saved by what we don't know. But true knowledge goes beyond that. We don't master it, it masters us. Paul is talking about knowing that is personal and real. You're so sure it's true that it's life-changing. And you live a certain way because of it. Here's one way to think about it. I'm the youngest of five kids. And when I was about six years old, we were visiting my grandfather in Pennsylvania. And uh, my older brothers and sisters decided to take me to the pool, and they thought it was time for Jimmy to learn how to jump off the high dive. So they got me up there. I climbed up all those steps, and I walked out to the end. And you know how it is. You're kind of standing there, and it's kind of moving a little bit. And I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't jump. Why not? Because I knew what would happen. I had some knowledge. And that knowledge told me that if I stepped off this diving board, I would fall. That knowledge controlled me. I lived for those 15 minutes that I stood there on the basis of that knowledge. This wasn't just intellectual knowledge. I couldn't have quoted Newton's law of gravity or Einstein's field equations. But I knew what would happen. Now, eventually, I did jump, and I added to my knowledge, I found that the water actually catches you, and it's a lot of fun. But that's the kind of knowing that he's talking about here, being convinced of a fact of reality so much so that you live it. We know things all the time. You know things when you're driving. You see a green light, and you know to keep going. You don't stop. You keep going. Why? Because you know what that means, and it controls you. You check both ways, but it controls you. You come to a bridge, and you know that it will hold you, and you keep driving. Or I happen to know that Lisa likes flowers. And so when I'm walking through Costco... And I come to that conveniently placed kiosk right near the checkout. They put it there for a reason. I see pink roses, and what do I do? I buy the pink roses because I know what she likes. 
It's a sort of knowledge that changes the way you live. This knowledge of God's will is a deep personal knowledge that controls me. It's not just mastering the content to ace the Bible test, but it's real to me. And if it's not real to me, I don't live it. For instance, I can say, I know God loves me, but I hate myself. Well, I don't really know it then. Or I know I'm forgiven, but I'm still feeling guilty. Well, I don't really know it then. Or I know I should give, but I don't want to. I know I should serve, but I don't want to. And if that's the case, then I don't really know it. I think something else is true. I think that God, I don't know that God provides. I really think what I really know is that I have to take care of myself. I know that Christ rules over all creation, but I don't want to follow him or live for him. And if that's the way I think, then I don't really know it. It's not shaping me. And in fact, what this means, this sort of knowledge, is means that that I'm actually in touch with reality. I see things the way they really are. And I'm not living a fiction or a lie. So the knowledge of God's will is a real, true, personal, heart knowledge of what God has done in Christ. I'm convinced Jesus is restoring all things and all creation under his rule. And that's why the Apostle Paul prays for believers to be filled with the knowledge of God's will. They already had a knowledge of God, the knowledge of God's will. He uses the same root word up in verse 6 when he says that they understood the grace of God and truth. It's the same root word as knowledge. But now Paul prays for this knowledge to fill them. What does that mean? That has to do with capacity. It's not compartmentalized. I'm not compartmentalizing the religious part of my life over here so that I believe this when I go to church, but it doesn't really affect the way I live. No, this knowledge of God's will fills me so that wherever I am and in every sphere of my life, I live this way, whether I'm at church, at work, at home with my family, at the store. I live this way. It fills me. And the sense of filling also has to do with controlling. It defines me. This is what comes out of me. Like God's presence filled the temple, like the waters filled the sea, this knowledge fills my life, and that's how I live. So this isn't just dry intellectual knowledge. It's actually what I believe about life. What is really true? Where does this knowledge come from? Well, God gives it to us by his Holy Spirit. He says to have the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Now, when you see that word spiritual, you might think to yourself, well, that has to do with like the spiritual world of like ghosts and things like that. That's not what it's talking about. The word spiritual here has to do with something God's spirit gives. This knowledge of God's will that comes in wisdom and understanding is from God's will. is is from God's spirit. The NIV translates this verse this way, and listen to the way it puts it. It's helpful the way it translates it. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all wisdom and understanding that the spirit gives. The spirit gives us wisdom and understanding. He's the one that gives us the knowledge of his will. If you're a Christian... God's Holy Spirit gives you wisdom, helping you know how to live. What is God's will in this situation? Because frankly, that's not always easy to know. We deal with difficult situations, difficult problems, difficult choices, difficult people. How do I obey God here? What does he want me to do? We need wisdom to know God's will. And we need understanding, insight. He awakens our minds. The Holy Spirit opens our minds to see spiritual truth. 
So this is how we should pray for each other and for Camelback as a church. There is nothing dry or cerebral about it. We pray for true knowledge of God, real personal knowledge of Christ to grip our hearts, to fill us, to actually see reality. And for the Holy Spirit to open our eyes and to show us how to live. This is Paul's one great request for the church. And what are the results of this knowledge? If we really do know God's will in the way he's talking about here, then we're going to live lives that are worthy of Jesus. So as to, do you see those words, so as to? That's talking about purpose, about result. So as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him. The idea of our walk has to do with our lifestyle, our conduct, what people see during the week. And the question here is, is my life, is my conduct worthy of Christ? That is an amazing thought. Worthy of Christ. Think about who Christ is. The paragraph that we're going to look at next week takes your breath away. It's mind-blowing. This is Christ, and I have to live worthy of him? Really? Think about what he's done. All he's done for our salvation. And I have to live worthy of that? That's a high bar. That's a high calling. And Paul gives four examples of what that looks like. Four examples of how we should live. And grammatically, there are four participles that follow here that describe what it means to walk worthy of Christ and please him. These are the kind of lives that we should pray for, the kind of lives that are filled with the real knowledge of God. First, we see that a life worthy of Christ is fruitful, fruitful. He says, bearing fruit in every good work. Now, this makes sense. Living things grow. A healthy tree bears fruit. If you have an apple tree and you don't get any apples, something's wrong. So, of course, we bear fruit. And good fruit starts inside, in the heart. It's not a checklist of things that you decide to do. I'm going to do these good works. No, it actually starts in the heart. The Holy Spirit begins inside of us, and he works from the inside out. Galatians chapter 5, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. He changes us from the inside so that what we do on the outside is different. And based on this internal change, Jesus' followers do good in all sorts of ways. We're generous with our time. We show compassion. We listen. We give advice when we're asked. We're generous to those in need. We feed the hungry. We forgive. We obey the government. And that's just the beginning. Every good work. A life worthy of Christ is fruitful. And a life worthy of Christ is growing. He says, increasing in the knowledge of God. He's already said, prayed that we would know God's will. And now he says to increase in the knowledge of God, to be growing. That means we're not content to stay where we are. I read the Bible once, I don't need to read it again. I went to church once, I listened to a sermon once, I don't need to sing more or pray more. I've done that. That makes no sense. If you love something, you want more of it. I was driving the other day and I saw a sign, a big sign for the Barrett Jackson Auto Show coming up at Westworld. And the people who go to that love cars. You're not going to hear them say, I saw one car, I don't need to see another. What do they say? They say, I love cars, I want to see more of them. And I want to see what he's done over here to this one. And I want to see what's coming out over here from this manufacturer. I know cars, and I want to see more cars. And that's true for anything we love. Imagine saying, I know God, and I love him, but I don't want any more of him. I've got enough. That makes no sense. 
especially because it's not the knowledge of God's will here, but here it's growing, increasing in the knowledge of God himself, knowing him, the infinite, beautiful, perfect, glorious God. He is the most fascinating and captivating and satisfying and thrilling and exciting thing in the universe. To see him and to know him is better than the best you can imagine. If you don't want more of him, then you don't know him. That's why the psalmist says, one thing I have asked of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple, increasing in the knowledge of God. So as we pray for our church family, pray that we would increase in the knowledge of God and know him and hunger and thirst for more of him. A life worthy of Christ is growing. And a life worthy of Christ that results from being filled with the knowledge of his will, a life worthy of Christ is strong, verse 11, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience. And notice that's a passive verb, being strengthened. It's something that's happening to you. And because it's happening to you, you are strong. It's not your strength. It's God's strength at work in you, power from God himself. Think about what this means. Just think about this for a second. All power. And it's all power from God. And not just that. He doesn't want you to miss it. He says, according to his glorious might. Imagine that kind of power. Sometimes we don't feel like we have that kind of power. If you buy a camping trailer and you want to drive to Flagstaff, you need to make sure that your rig has enough power to get up over the mountains and down to Camp Verde and then back up again. And you might think to yourself, this truck, this SUV, this car doesn't have enough power. I need something bigger. We often feel that way as Christians. I'm not strong enough for what God has called me to do. I don't have the power for this good work that he's placed before me. I can't do this. My dad used to say to me, the Lord's commands are his enablements. What God puts in front of you to do will give you the strength to do. We're not very far after Christmas. You remember the angel's words to Mary, is anything too hard for the Lord? For the God who created everything, anything beyond this glorious might, his glorious might, The same power, and this is amazing, the same power that was working in Jesus himself is working in you as a believer. God's power. In Ephesians chapter 1, Paul prays that Christians would see and know the immeasurable greatness of God's power toward us who believe according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Resurrection power, life-giving power, exalting power, raising power, the same power that's at work in Christ is at work in you by his Holy Spirit. That is an awesome thought. Now, what does this power actually look like if it's working in you? Notice that he says that the focus of this divine power is patient endurance. You might think that if God's power is at work in me, his power that's according to his glorious might, it's going to be flashy miracles. And this great success story. But that's not what it is. It's patient endurance. Ordinary Christians like you and me who persevere 
and keep walking with Jesus down the most grueling roads. And you have no business standing straight still. You should be collapsed. You shouldn't be making it. And yet you look at them and you say, there they are. How can it be? It's God's power. By all rights, they should collapse and be crushed. They may not feel strong. You've probably never felt so weak, but they endure. And that's God's power. Christians who endure false teaching, and that's probably one of the things that's first and foremost on his mind as he's writing to the church in Colossae. I don't know why, but I know that's not true. And I'm going to keep on walking with Jesus. I can't argue with you, but I know what's true, and I'm going to keep on walking with Jesus, and they endure God's power. Christians who endure physical suffering, pain every day, like Job, and people close to them are saying, why do you keep on going? Curse God and die. What's in it for you? What has God done for you that you would continue to walk with him when this is what's happening to your body? Doesn't work to follow him, but they endure God's power. Christians who endure patiently deep disappointment a relationship, maybe one that never happened, or a broken relationship, a painful one, or bankruptcy, or losing a loved one, some deep hurt and disappointment, and they endure. How do they do it? God's power. Spiritual questions, wrestling with doubt, a dark night of the soul, depression and anxiety, and yet they're holding on as best as they can. How? God's power. Fighting sin and temptation. How? God's power. So as we pray for Camelback, may God strengthen us with all power so we endure. And the fourth example he gives is thankfulness, a life worthy of Christ, a life that knows God's will is thankful. Picking up at the end of verse, uh, end of verse 11, with joy, we're going to have that with what follows, not with what's before, with joy giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. If we see what God has done for us in Christ, if we know his will, we can't thank him enough. And Paul lists three specific reasons that we thank him that make us joyfully thankful in verses 12 through 14. First, he qualified us to be heirs. Have you ever been an heir? If you're in a will, either you're in the will or not in the will. And if you're not, you're out of luck. But God has qualified us to be heirs. We have full standing as enlightened members of God's chosen people. The false teachers in Colossae, we're going to find out in chapter 2, were trying to disqualify them. You ordinary Christians need to be enlightened. You're second-class citizens. But God himself makes us heirs of an eternal kingdom where there'll be no more night. Jesus Christ is our light, and we begin to live in that light today. We are heirs, and he's qualified you. He's the one that's done it. And not only that, he rescued us from the power of darkness. Like SEAL Team 6, he broke down the door of the dungeon that locked us in and rescued us from Satan's power. And he didn't just bring us out of the prison and leave us on the sidewalk, weak and vulnerable, shivering with no home, saying, what do I do now? Yeah, I'm set free, but what now? No, he brought us and he made us citizens 
of his kingdom. And so now we belong to Jesus. He took us from the grave and he gave us a crown. And he redeemed us from our sins. That's what what he says in verse 14, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. We were sold into slavery because of our sins, but he walked into the slave market. He found us. He bought us back with the blood of Jesus. He redeemed us. So we thank him. Of all people, we should be thankful people. And as we pray for Camelback, we pray for thankful hearts. If you know God, if you know his will in a life-changing way, what he is doing in this world through Christ, his will, then you're going to live a life worthy of him. It's going to change the way you live because you see reality. You see what's really true. So let's take a minute and and do what he's talking about here and let's pray for ourselves and for our church. I'm going to read uh, some of these verses and summarize some of them, and I'll just pause for a second and uh, go ahead and pray that for yourself, for your family, for your community group, for the church as a whole. And let's start back with verse 9. Let's bow our heads. And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Let's pray that for ourselves. So as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him. Let's pray for worthy lives. Let's pray that God would make us fruitful. And growing. and strong so that we endure. And thankful. Lord, hear our prayer. Amen. All right, let us go ahead and stand up um, as we sing this last song together. And let us be thinking about living in the reality, having the knowledge, and letting that lead us to depend on the Lord as we sing the song, Lord, I Need You.
temptation comes my way. be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Amen and go with God.